Hello and welcome to the Surgical Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Haider Al-Hakim, the Third Eye Doctor. Pull up a chair and get ready for some candid and uncompromising discussion with experts, innovators, agitators, and influential people from every corner of health and well-being. From inside the hospital to at home in the kitchen, we're leaving no stone unturned in our quest to uncover the secrets of healthier, happier, more successful, and less stressful lives. Thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, let's meet this episode's guest. Hello, Asif. How are you today? Hi, Heather. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year, everyone. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yes, I'm very well. Uh, yes, Happy New Year. Um, we're recording this sort of like you know, over a week after the new year. I mean, when do we stop saying Happy New Year? When, when, when's the I'm not year? sure. I think um, probably tomorrow, because that'll be the first Monday at work of the of the new year, won't it? So Monday the 10th will be the first Monday at work. So I think that should signal the end of Happy New Year. <laughs> so how was the new year period, you know, the holiday period for you? It was great. First time I've taken a break. I, I've been working nonstop for, you know, most New Year's and Christmas and Boxing Day for about eight, nine years. Took two weeks off. Went um, to Mecca on the smaller pilgrimage, hence the short hair. Um, feel great. Yeah, come back uh, reinvigorated, refreshed. And um, first time I've actually enjoyed a break because in the last two years, COVID has it's been quite mental. And then before that, being in training, December is quite a busy time for, for like a medical reg or a medical SHO. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the hospitals were packed before COVID and um, the hospitals are probably empty at the moment. But, you know, God knows what's happening on, you know, sort of in, in the real world. Um, so was that the first time that you went to the pilgrimage in, in Mecca? It was the first time, yeah. So it kind of came impromptu. So I wasn't aware you could do a DIY package. So I thought, you know, I'm going to have to pay some some uncle over the uh, you know over the top odds for for Umrah package. But I managed to actually do a DIY and, and get it down to a really you know reasonable price. So I did all my Booking.com hotels and my my my, my flights and uh, everything was dead cheap because of COVID. Because the hotels were really you know asking for guests. So I got some really good hotels and got some decent flights. But the, the, the real cost nowadays in world travel is the PCR testing. So that cost me an arm and a leg. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, the first time I went and um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite surreal doing a pilgrimage in the middle of COVID because there wasn't many people there. It was pretty empty. You know, I'm sure you've seen, you might have even been, you know, there's, there's um, lots of, you know, there's thousands and tens of thousands of people normally. Um, but uh, you could say hundreds this time. There wasn't many at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the last time I went was in two thousand and five, and um, yeah, it was hundreds of thousands of people, mm -hmm. and you know, back then, you know, people who were coughing and, and you know, sort of doing, <laughs> you know, doing anything respiratory wasn't such a big deal back then. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of weird now, and and I mean, do 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 you think that kind of sort of diminished the sort of spirituality or the sort of the presence in any way in in your mind, or or not really? Um, it's somewhat, yeah, because yeah. you weren't able to get close to the Kaaba. There was a lot of construction work as well, yeah. and um, yeah, you know, I was looking forward to you know what you see on TV, just you know, a lot of people all um, doing. Um, the dwarf, you know, is it called a, cir a circumambulation? I think the English word yeah. circumambulation. Yeah. Around, yeah. So, and you see, you know, people in groups, and it wasn't like that at all. It, it was so empty you could run around, <laughs> actually. So uh, it did diminish in that sense, um, but nevertheless, the spiritual aspect for me, you know, I, I felt really cleansed. I felt very much at home. I felt very much at peace. Working back to back winters in the NHS during COVID, and then. It, it was non-stop really and you know having gone through so, so many things behind the scenes it was what I needed and um, I want to go back again hopefully maybe in the summertime for Hajj if I, you know if, if permits get released because Hajj is all about permits each country gets its own allocation of permits so um, we're still waiting for the UK allocation. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a drug. I mean, I, I remember the last time I went, you know, I thought to myself, right, every year, you know, I've got to yeah, go because yeah, you feel yeah. so, Absolutely. you know, kind of, you know, refreshed and clean, so to speak, and yeah. like a clean slate. And you think to yourself, yeah. well, yeah. I can't lose this opportunity. But then, you know, you can't, you know, you, you have your first ice cream, your second ice cream, <laughs> your, your first crisp, and then yeah, it's kind of right here. You reminded me actually. Hope you don't mind, but it's going to melt the lights. And like I say, I've had to blow my screen because I'm stood while I'm sat to right in front of a, a radiator. And I'm well, don't make too much head. noise. Don't make too much noise. No, no, no. Okay, I'll unwrap it, and uh, I can't have a messy. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't have it melting. But yes, yeah, quite ironic because I went to a hot country and hardly had any ice cream, and I'm, I'm back in a cold country, and I'm having ice cream, but. Um, it's well, it's choice, them. isn't it? I mean, it's choice, isn't it? I think there's, you know, there's a bit more choice here. But but then, you know, they've got all the, um, you know, the famous brands out there, haven't they? They um, have, yeah. And, and Mecca now, Heather, it's very commercialised. So when you go to the Kaaba and the Grand Mosque, outside they've got KFC and McDonald's and Baskin Robbins and Starbucks and very commercialised. Um, it's, it's massively different now to what it was about 10 years ago. Clock towers there. You can actually pray, go out for a KFC and come back in. Um, I'm not so, a fan yeah. of that clock tower, I must say. You know, it just reminds me of, you know, the eye of Sauron watching you. <laughs> yes, it is big. It's very, it's very um, grand and overpowering. Um, it's a nice scene at night time, but uh, I know a lot of people have their objections. And it's really close to the Kaaba as well. There's not much proximity. There's not much um, distance there at all. And, all this building, I think they've got a plan by 2030 to complete the the development and increase the capacity of the whole Grand Mosque area to accommodate more people. Because I'm assuming when COVID is over, if it ever is over, there's going to be a lot of people who have deferred their Hajj. And Hajj is going to be, you know, perhaps 3 million people in the coming years. Yeah, so and you you know pe people are kind of just biting at the uh, at the bits to um, mm. you know just just like you're biting into the <laughs> you know sort of ice cream now. I, you, you know, guys, if if you hear some munching, it's 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 Doctor Asif uh, devouring one of his uh, many uh, Magnum Almond Vegan one, Magnum Almond Vegan special. What do you mean vegan special? They're all vegan, it's aren't they? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a vegan ice cream, apparently, but it's a bit drier, a bit more chalky, but it's a bit more flavour, actually. I like it. It's called, it's, it's a vegan one. So there's so there's the non-vegan one, so, is there? Yeah, the, the one vegan one is, is a normal one, so to speak, but this vegan one is, uh, I don't know, I just find it a bit, uh, I like it a bit more. <laughs> I'm not a vegan, but uh, the vegan almond magnum is, is quite nice. All, other brands are available. Yeah, yeah, of course. Heather, I mean, I'm yeah, a, yeah, yeah. I must say, you know, you, 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 put a disclaimer out there. You are, you're not being sponsored by Magnum. It just happens to be one of your guests is eating a Magnum. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have enough listeners for us to be, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> having them sponsor us uh, uh, on the podcast. One day, sure. one day. One day, yeah. I mean, fair, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not a Joe Rogan kind of level of... Uh, uh interaction so i mean um tell us what happened during covid work-wise covid was incredibly busy i started off at a medical reg just before covid actually february march time covid hit hit the shores in march 2020 i managed to step up as a consultant then i, I got a, a contract for for about two months on a designated COVID ward and old orthopedic ward. So I worked there as a medical consultant, um, locuming, was very busy. Um, I, I, a lot of our initial patients were quite young, actually, you know, mid thirties, mid similar age to me, uh, but coming in, no comorbidities, but coming in quite unwell. By that time, there's no real treatment beyond Cormoxiclav, which, you know, as you know, it's antibiotic um, and oxygen nebulizers, you know, the whole recovery trial was in its early phases and obviously there was no vaccine as well so we were all kind of you know 
uh, throwing th throwing darts in the dark, uh, looking at treatment options, different centers were looking at novel kind of um, therapies as well, steroid therapies and all sorts of mon monoclonal antibodies, etc. And then as COVID went in the first wave, we got a bit more uh, substantial evidence from the States and from China and Korea about efficacy of certain medications. So we started using that, the social recovery. And then uh, it, which, you know, it was busy, like wearing PPE what, for 12 hours. Which medications were you, were you using at the time? So we, we use, initially we used to be a dexamethasone. We, uh, we used remdesivir as well. And it's all part of the recovery trial. So it depended on which arm you were allocated to. So we, we instigated recovery around about mid-April, kind of four weeks into it, really. And at, at that time, there was, I believe, four rounds, and then it became five, and then it became six as well. Some of them were taken off. So throughout 2020, we used recovery. And so, again, evidence base wasn't that high for most of these kind of novel treatments in, in light of COVID. So a lot of it was conservative management, supportive treatment, oxygen, steroids, any symptoms of acute respiratory distress, we would offload them with furosemide, um, use CPAP as well. Some of the severe cases went to level two and level three care requiring intubation. So it was a real unknown entity. You know, it was, it was some, some days were like being in a war zone. Because so many people will come in in respiratory distress. I remember one nurse came in, she was 55 years old, Afro-Caribbean. And, uh, you know, having to discuss DNA, CPR and all the escalation plans with her, uh, for someone who's relatively young, she's still working, um, was a, a, a real eye opener for me. And just the volume of discussions we had to have with family, there was no relatives allowed in, we had to, use, we had to get a lot of iPhones and tablets and do video calls with patients. At the same time, we got a lot of support from surrounding businesses, so local shops, computer shops and Supermarkets gave us free tablets, uh, you know, iPads, etc. We got a lot of, you know, free pizzas and coffee, and there was a lot of goodwill around that time. And um, so, yeah, you know, experienced uh, the whole spectrum, good and bad. You know, some good teamwork, good morale lifting, and, and team building exercises. Lots of training because you know we had to train if orthopedic doctors and nurses who hadn't been um, medically trained yet to give them some training in oxygen therapy and how to use CPAP fittings and all that kind of stuff. And um, I had to shave my beard, which is the uh, first time for me for a long, long time because I couldn't get the proper fit of the, of the PPE masks. And um, it, it slowed down in, in the summer and then picked up massively in 2020. The winter of 2020 was the worst I've seen, like 10 years in the NHS. So it was a really big winter, really lots of admissions. And like you mentioned, Heather, earlier, it was already a broken NHS. You know, we, we were struggling anyway in terms of staff retention, in terms of vacancies and elderly admissions to the hospital anyway before COVID. So when COVID hit, COVID hit the shores and that first winter, 2020 slash 2021, so this time last year, that was the first winter of COVID. And um, that was tough. That was very tough because we, we were dealing with COVID and influenza and the usual community required pneumonias and then the hip patients who were getting all sorts of complications, you know, slipping on ice, getting pneumonia in the, in the care home. Uh, that was, yeah, that was a, I, I, it's probably caused my hair loss that winter. Yeah, I mean, it's not receding too badly. I mean, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, what was going through your head when you were sort of about to experience, you know, the winter of uh, 2020 and, you know, the start of 2021? Were, were you thinking, oh, here we go again, or... Um, were you like, oh, we've got some, you know, things in our pocket that we can throw at it? Or were you just unsure what was going to happen? I think, yeah, we were more unsure because of volume increase. So that was a second wave. So second wave, there was more volume. And in spite of treatment, the number of cases was, was, was much higher. So we did have, have a bit of optimism. We were now eight months into the recovery trial. We were getting some... Pre preliminary data about the efficacy of certain medications and then culture scene was added and taken away and etc etc so we got some new treatments um as part of the recovery trial so we were hopeful for, for younger people who had slightly higher chance of survival because of very little in the way of pre-existing comorbidities but the elderly that were getting covid you know a lot of them unfortunately weren't making it so mortality rates were kind of 
peaking during that time and I ICUs were full. But at the same time, there was a bit of a hope because vac vaccinations were introduced in December of 2020. And the first kind of uptake was kind of mid-December, particularly for NHS staff. So we saw, we, we thought, you know, we're kind of winning. We thought by 2021, there might be some normality. And, uh, you know, little did we know of this kind of um, uh, variants and, you know, kind of genetic, um, you know, genetic shift and antigenic shift and shift, you know, um, of the variants. And uh, 2021 was much the same as 2020, actually, you know, lots of uh, measures in place and social distancing, mask wearing, double dose vaccinations, and then third dose, you know, uh, booster doses. And then there's now talk of a fourth dose, perhaps in 2022. So we're still very much in the midst of a pandemic, you know, things haven't really slowed down. And if you look at some of the numbers, the, um, especially from a couple of weekends ago, it, ICU capacity is still quite high. Well, yeah. I mean, the, oh, occupancy is quite high. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of the treatments, I mean, what, what you know, which treatments were, were, were having the best um, efficacy, you know? Well, for my, yeah, so some, um, well, personally, I'll, Look, looking at uh, where I worked, so we, we use dexamethasone. So that we we use that kind of quite broadly actually, and um, that seemed to be quite efficacious. Although we're sending um, people's sugars sky high, so there's actually some guidelines on managing kind of glucocorticoid related, um, you know, high blood sugars um, in non-diabetic patients. So there were some good guidelines from the guys in Cambridge. Um, looking at, you know, because some of the sugars were like 1920 because they want high dose dexamethasone. So I think that, in my experience, worked quite well. Um, uh, other than that, CPAP worked. As you know, Boris had CPAP as well when he was in for a couple of days. Um, so that was it, really. Beyond that, uh, it's hard to say because you had to follow patients up long term. We had these virtual COVID clinics where we'd send patients home with a, with a pulse oximeter. And we'd see how they they would respond at home. So uh, just to ease up capacity in the hospitals as well, we'll send patients home, monitor them in our patient setting. And uh, but yeah, I think dexamethasone was, was quite. It, it's not novel. We've used it before. Uh, we used it you know, for, for many many things. But in this particular setting, for the symptoms of acute respiratory distress syndrome, the ARDS pattern we got with COVID, it seemed to be quite efficacious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know stuff like zinc would you know did, did that come into the equation or you know ivermectin or you know yeah so any of yeah. these things yeah so that was a bit later i think zinc didn't i, I didn't really come across that much um um but yeah uh, ivermectin as well they've used that before they've used that in patients with aids and you know pjp well it used to be called uh, pcp but uh, pjp infections as well um fungal kind of opportunistic infections and then again you've got the the um, opportunistic infections which again came you know evermectin was was a treatment of choice for that really and kind of fluconazoles intravenous antifungals were because what we saw which was quite alarming was uh, you know invasive fungal infections on a background of covid so we're getting periorbital cellulitis you know horrible uh, you know deep seated bony infections as well you know some osteomyelitis even we're getting a lot of DVTs and, and PEs in, in COVID patients. So it just opened up Pandora's box, really. And, uh, you know, the very high risk uh, of developing a VTE whilst he had COVID. So a lot of hospitals were sending patients home with like five days of injections for uh, low, molecular, uh, low molecular weight heparin. So actually some, some patients were sending, uh, you know, a slightly longer, so about 25 days, 28 days. But usually within a week, you, should, you know, you take them at home and then come up with them. Because there's such a high risk of developing complications down the line, and as we know now, you know, long COVID, footballers have got it as well. Not, some of them are, haven't really recovered their baseline capacity in terms of total lung capacity as well. And you know, now we're getting the first set of long COVID clinics, so people with kind of just long-term scarring and breathlessness, exertional um, breathlessness, and just the effect, effects of the first wave uh, almost two years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and. Um... You know that's that's like to stay with us for some time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in in terms of the sort of the morale of the staff, I mean, I guess it it was going in waves uh, rather than just just going down and down with with time. 
Yeah, was yeah it like... I think, yeah, no, it was going in waves. And, um, you know, uh, first wave, we were very, uh, we, we had that kind of a lot of energy, um, lots of fuel from the local supermarkets and surplus sandwiches. And, you know, we were very well fed. And then th th there was COVID among staff, you know, a lot of staff were off ill. And, um, you know, um, low staff numbers causes a, a, a low morale. You know, people are off ill, you're having to cover shifts. Some of your colleagues may have died even, uh, or got, you know, um, very unwell. So I, th I think then staff morale towards the end of the first wave did decline. And then it picks up in, you know, it peaks and troughs really. And, uh, but I think it's been a tough year, two years for NHS generally, nurses, doctors, and allied health professionals and I think we've all done a great job we've all come together as a team I remember my first ward round as a consultant I had uh, obstetric doctors and all sorts of specialities working together and uh, that was great to see different people come together and we had to train people you know we had to train nurses and physios and other doctors in basic CPAP and oxygen management because uh, it was literally everyone required oxygen um, and it was unprecedented and, and, and I've never seen a scene like that the scenes were quite unprecedented um, uh, you know seeing patients in the midst of a pandemic not knowing what to do gasping for breath unsure about unsure about outcome not being able to see their family it was distressing for patients and relatives alike and, and how how did that change you as a as a person? I think it makes you quite grateful. And um, I saw people my age die. I've seen colleagues slightly older than me in their forties pass away as well. You know, colleagues that I've worked with. Uh, it makes you grateful. It also makes you. Um, I think it gives you a perspective on life. You know, because uh, I think the first person that kind of blew the lid on COVID. He died. He, he was a young Taiwan, I think Taiwanese or Chinese doctor. Uh, you know, he, he passed away. Lots of doctors in Italy passed away. We've had quite a few doctors in the UK pass away as well. And uh, it makes you, I think it gives you a real, it changes your narrative on life, you know. Um, it makes you more grateful. It makes you, um, what's the word? I think a bit more pensive and, and a bit more reflective and kind of introspective. And then during that time, I, for the first time in my life, I, I wrote a will in 2020. I never thought I'd write a will age 31. I wrote a will for, uh, for my two young boys. I um, started journaling, you know, gratitude to journaling. I thought, you know, what if I get it? What if I get COVID? And, you know, it's beyond recovery. And so I started, you know, really getting, um, you know, get, getting my, my, my things in order. Because you just never know. All it takes is just one patient and then you, you can um, contract it. And then if you're not being vaccinated, it could be a slippery slope downhill and, you know, you could re require CPAP and then not recover. As you've seen only like in maybe four weeks ago, quite a, um, um, quite a prominent, I, I believe he was a cardiothoracic surgeon, 44 years old, passed away. He had three or four young kids and you just never know, um, you know, with COVID and, you know, you might not have any underlying health conditions, but... If it gets you bad, it gets you bad, and and you can't really predict that. Yeah, yeah. Did did, did you have any thoughts of of changing careers or stopping being a doctor? Yeah, I think that's when my whole kind of career journey started, really, in in between the first and second wave. So um, I was looking, I was getting a lot of calls from um, firms in consulting and management and strategy, and you know wanting to recruit doctors, but I was so preoccupied with, with working on the front line and then expecting my second child, I was so busy. And then when things settled in 2021, I kind of took them off as more seriously. And, and that's when, you know, I thought I've, do, I've done my part now. I've worked throughout the first two waves. I've led teams, I've led the response. I've um, advocated for increased PPE. I've uh, I've done my my uh, um, my duty, and I would still like to work in, in healthcare, but from the, the the kind of the back seat, you know, not the front line, more of the upstream. Because I, I integrated, I did a public health master's degree during medical school, so I was very much interested in healthcare systems and upstream interventions, vaccinations, that kind of stuff. So when the opportunity came, 
last year to work for a consulting firm looking at healthcare strategy and digital health, uh, particularly during COVID and COVID testing kits, etc. I snapped it up because um, I had a felt as though I've done my duty uh, in the NHS, you know, 10 years. And secondly, I felt I had enough experience with kind of strategy, healthcare management, uh, training, teaching, um, and you know, quality improvements within hospitals to actually take that with me to this new role where I'm working very much behind the scenes, looking at um, COVID testing and atom uh, atom kits. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 sort of sense of you know guilt wasn't wasn't as high. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't as high because I'd worked quite quite hard over the over two terms, and also, um, you know, I, I thought to myself, this now or never, I can actually contribute um, working in healthcare consulting. Even though I'm not, I'm not working as a doctor technically. I can still use my medical hat and um, actually still uh, shape healthcare. And um, you know, if I was doing a random project on on an oil rig or working in uh, you know in marketing or something like that, but I'm still within healthcare, so I'm I'm quite pleased. And I know a lot of medics do make the move away from medicine into consulting or into strategy or into you know journalism, whatever. And, and, and there's a sense of a goal because medicine is the only thing you know, you know, since you were a teenager, you've trained to be a doctor. It's your bread and butter, it's your pride and joy. But um, I think my guilt has been somewhat numbed by the fact that I'm still working with hospitals very much. I'm still speaking to medical directors. I'm still speaking to chief nurses on, 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 a, on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, how, how, how do you make that transition? Because, you know, if you're a, one trick pony you know how, how, how do you learn these other skills i think diversifying is important so uh, i think a lot of people now integrate it, it seems to be the thing to do you know especially in london you have to integrate it's compulsory you do five years and then you do one year integration i think that one year it, it can be quite useful for me it was very useful i did a public health master's degree and so i, I used that kind of transferable skills looking at healthcare systems uh, healthcare uptake, vaccination rates, immunizations, all that kind of stuff, and how public health works. And, and, and I use that in this new job. So I think that one year of master's level learning was very um, beneficial for me. But how to kind of look at other opportunities, you know, I think now the buzzword seems to be med tech and digital healthcare. And I think most doctors have been involved in some sort of quality improvement project. And having and using that skill set into any kind of allied health role, it can be quite a natural overlap. So if you've done a quality improvement or audit work or some sort of you know full full cycle of you know re clinical restructuring, for, for instance, it, when you were a trainee, that can be used and um, in um, in new healthcare roles, particularly for for startups, so there's a lot of startups now. Uh, last two years, it's been a big mushroom, mushrooming of startups looking at uh, atom testing, whether it's blood pressure or COVID or uh, SDIs or whatever. You know, there's so many digital health companies now in atom blood testing. Even you know, blood testing, finger prick testing is a big thing now. But there's so many companies, and um, these kind of opportunities. Are, are always available and I think uh, as a doctor we're quite privileged in the sense that we have a lot of transferable skills for communication, lateral thinking, ability to to make decisions under pressure, ability to prioritize and ability to communicate. You know we can communicate to medical directors, we can present, we can talk, we can you know abstract think, we can write journals, we can you know um, analyze using complex statistical techniques as well so I think doctors we have we wear a lot of hats and um, a lot of companies look for these kind of skills these soft skills and um, you know we can certainly use them in uh, in other fields yeah yeah so, so certainly I mean when I was in medical school uh, you know this thing didn't really exist and um, mm -hmm. it was it was it was literally you were trained to be a consultant and that was it you know, no one talked about uh, changing careers or having many careers uh, at any one time. So um, I guess it's um, 
yeah it's a it's the evolution of the modern doctor and and you know probably in five or ten years time it will be totally different as well you know what yeah what the mo modern doctor Absolutely. will be especially now with the increasing utilization of ai robotics machine learning coding all this kind of, all this kind of digital you know ass assets and digital kind of um you know we've got cryptocurrency now we've got blockchain so many things so things yeah you're right will be massively different in 10 years time i mean do you see a role of the traditional physician um you know in sort of five to ten years time i think i read an article a piece about one or two years ago again in in your field really ophthalmology saying some of the um ai diet diagnosed kind of uh, grading of retinopathies were much more accurate via um, you know some kind of robotic process than they were via doctors and so I suppose you know like even now you know ro robotic prostate removals and uh, you know um, some hernia repairs you know robotic surgery and all these kind of things so I, I think some of the more procedural specialities yes there might be some um, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of, what's the word? Um, uh, you know, robots, et cetera, could, could take over. But I think some of the more uh, specialities, which are more, you know, require a bit more, let's say, lateral thinking, and they're not very really protocol driven, they're not very really algorithmic, like geriatrics, for instance, and then I think they'll be quite difficult to replace because, especially now with a growing population of elderly citizens, it'll be quite difficult to replace elderly care medicine with any kind of machine derived algorithms but certainly algorithmic specialities like you know cardiology for instance there could be some kind of room for machine learning and beyond that there's quite a lot of room for allied health allied health professionals as well the like ahps and you know um, advanced clinical practitioners and extended scope physios i think that has been a real change in the last four or five years, really. Um, lots of allied health professionals doing junior doctor jobs. And whether that's going to change the workforce, I think it, it, it probably will. And there has been calls now for these medical apprenticeships you might have seen now. So kind of shorter versions of, a, of training for, for people who have worked in the NHS before, as physios or nurses or whatever, and then doing their whole shortened medical degree route but the practical skills aspect of that and then working as f1s and f2s so i think things are changing workflow we know the, the workforce is going to look markedly different at the moment we've got like 200 000 doctors in the uk that could either increase or decrease you know it could go either way but one thing's for sure there's going to be more of a role of robotics and digital health and ai and machine learning as well as an increased role for allied health professionals as well yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we've got uh, optometrists who are um, going to start doing laser therapy as well uh, for the eyes. So that's um, so that's going to be interesting. And um, you know, th there's there's a lot of legal ramifications involved as well. You know about that. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. whether the patients uh, accept it or not, you know that that's market forces for you isn't it i mean yeah exactly yeah. you know market forces are there you've got amazon who is sort of already producing uh, this product called amazon pharmacy i think so they're so they're walking into the uh, amazon uh, pharmacy sphere um and you know there's independent prescribers pharmacists yeah, yeah. and optometrists and yeah, yeah. Um, so that nurse prescribers nurse specialists even as well like yeah. some nurse of the consultants pockets. yes yes exactly yeah yeah so things are changing. You know, you said things ch change from when you went to med school. Things have changed since w w when I went to med school. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's growing at an alarming pace. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, the thing that I've noticed is that, you know, as I've been doing my work uh, still in the NHS, um, that I've become more experienced, <laughs> whether that makes any sense or not. And um, experience still counts, even though, you know, even though you have, you know, all, all these wonderful technologies and wonderful algorithms, 
you know they still yeah. need need someone to interpret it and um, absolutely I've yeah. got other sort of doctors that sort of come and ask me about certain opinions. And I guess it's because I've got a few, you know, a few more gray hairs up, 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 <laughs> well, well, down here anyway, right, rather than up down there. there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there's still um, a need for experience and, uh, you know, people, you know, with, yeah. um, with the W word, I think that's called the wisdom word. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the the stuff that can be repeated, um, I think that can be given to the robots yeah. to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because there's only. I so think much. when you get to the clinical complexity, the grey areas, you, you need clinical acumen, and you know, I think specialities like palliative care will never ever be replaced with you know any kind of robots or a kind of digital processes because that just requires so much human input so much human you know empathy and, and and clinical acumen like palliative care but i think procedural uh, procedural um specialties for instance you know gastroenterology you know endoscopies could be be done by a robot like in, in 10 years time even now like i was in recess in november uh, on call and that was my last shift in medicine before i switched over and you know like all the arrests came with, with a Lucas device. So the compressions were done by the Lucas device, literally, you know, and um, was it effective? Was it just as effective? I think it was very effective, actually. Yeah. 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 I think what I've seen anyway over the last five years is the return of, sp of spontaneous circulation with, with the Lucas is actually much greater than, um, than, uh, than humans. Well, well, what are these so devices? Then, I've never seen these devices before. So I'll show you. Yeah, it's like this. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like a clamshell. It's like a clamshell on the chest. And it just, it just applies. It makes noise. Doot, doot, doot. It's all very synchronized. It's like, um, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's all, it's, 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 it's like, you know, uh, on the dot every. So it's doing, um, you know, the compressions uh, at the right force, at the right rate, right in the right area as well. Whereas the humans, there's a, there's a lag, different people. Um, you know, they can be Different delayed. stresses, yep. Yeah, exactly. And yes, we get a few more broken ribs from the Lucas device. They're very expensive, mind you. But um, what I've seen anyway, they're very effective. So, you know, in five years' time, there might not be any need for humans to do CPR because we've got just put these things on people's chests and just take them to the hospital. And, you know, that's, that's the crux of the matter. You know, it is um, quite expensive and it doesn't need a lot of money. And um, uh, large parts of the world out there have no money whatsoever. I mean, they have no doctors either, but then, yeah. you know, they don't have any money for this kind of technology. And, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, right. they'll, they'll, there'll always be a role for, you know, the old fashioned traditional doctor with, with, with just a stethoscope and the uh, tendon hammer yeah, uh, yeah. And, and a few pins. I remember, I mean, you know, that was a day that, you know, when I was on uh, medical on call, it was a couple of pins, stethoscope and a hammer, and off you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important. I mean, I never used to be able to, well, I was okay. I was okay. But but I did have a, um, a medical reg who was like six foot four, very intimidating and very, very arrogant. He was such an arrogant guy. You know, <laughs> have, you, have you followed? Have you followed him up? He, he, might, I mean, be, he might not be a, a professor of medicine, in, you know, somewhere in, in London. No, I didn't like him. I didn't like him at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to see him at all. Um, I don't know. I, I just um, he, he wasn't nice at all. Um, I didn't get on with him. Uh, who was the other uh, Reg? I can't remember the other edge because I had a couple of regs who was on I was on call with, but this guy was a real uh, nasty piece of work. Mm. I, I I couldn't get on with him. You, you you'll be very glad to know. I'm a friendly reg. When I was a reg, very friendly. I buy coffees for everyone. So quite different to to, to your experience. So hopefully, if I was your reg, you, you might come towards medicine. Well, I mean, I mean, I didn't really like um, hospital medicine full stop. Yeah, it totally tw mm -hmm. switched me off. I didn't like it. Was it the uh, long ward rounds? 
what what was it i you see i, I was much more interested in the non-physical part of wellness so you right. know the spiritual side of things rather than the physical side of things and spiritually you know it, it had no say whatsoever in the wellness of the patient and then when I thought well maybe psychiatry then I went you know so I had a look at psychiatry but it was just sort of weird diagnoses and locking people up and ECT and all these things yeah and I thought "Mm, I'm in trouble here so I so so I looked for something that didn't involve the ward and didn't involve the uh, hospital and I came to the conclusion that it was either pathology or you know ophthalmology Okay. so you know that was the reason why i uh, got into that but then you know with with time i i'm doing uh, you know less and less ophthalmology and more and more of the um you know the psychology of of things yeah 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 um, which is quite interesting i know i know you're interviewing me but uh, you know I, I saw your doctor on fire and i thought this guy's an ophthalmologist but he's writing a lot of stuff about uh, psychology and burnout and uh, like like you know how did he get into that? Because because that's something which I'm interested in massively. Well, I mean, you look, we all go through certain difficulties in life, and I went through an existential crisis when I was in Iraq, um, doing my uh, you know ophthalmology charity work because I set up a charity back in 2005, and I was going to Iraq every six months, uh, you know, setting up the service and doing operations and so on, and then. I left the NHS in 2010 and went back to Iraq and settled there. And I guess I had a sort of an identity crisis or a existential crisis to do with my belief system. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I realized that, you know, there's more to life than this psychological makeup. So I got, you know, I got studying into the works of um, the psychoanalysts and the psychotherapists and the psychodynamic works and i've always been interested in spirituality and sort of the metaphysical Mm -hmm. world of of existence and i just broadened it into sort of a more formal um it's not really a medical model it's more to do with therapy really Um, okay so yeah Mm. that's how i got interested through pain and my own suffering (laughs) which is a great gateway for a lot of us isn't it it is, yeah. I think pain is universal and pain is life, isn't it? The suffering is the default of life. And a very good book I read as a child, it was gifted to my father by my head teacher when I was like, I think 10 years old or something. It's called The Eye of the Spirit by Ken Weber. A great book, Eye of the Spirit. And that's what got me into spirituality. So I've always been interested. I, I do coaching as well. So I do a lot of life coaching. Um, and uh, yeah, I've always been interested in mindset and how that determines and, you know, as you're probably aware, I, I've been through a lot in the last kind of couple of years, but I've emerged stronger. I've still got my smile on my face because I think mindset is everything. And um, once you realize that life is meant to be, you know, it is a struggle. It's, it's you know, you, you get periods of bliss, you get periods of sadness, but the life, you know, it's neither good or no bad. And, and I think stoicism really helped me stoic philosophy so when i did my master's degree i looked at stoic people i looked at why um, stoic people didn't present to hospital with chest pain and that kind of really triggered my interest in stoicism and you know philosophies regarding um you know mindset and how to live life and you know suffering being default and how gratitude can change your serotonin levels and all that kind of thing and i use that a lot in my coaching and um yeah so when i saw your when i saw your amazon book and i thought this guy's um you know, is it, it, very, very diversified. And it's, uh, you know, I think when doctors write books, it usually is from their own pain. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some great books out there uh, about suffering. And a very good book, actually, actually I read last, well, I read, I reread it last week called um, On Being Mortal by Atal Gawande. And again, that's his own experience of, of med school and working as a doctor and his grandparents as well. So I think doctors can become very compelling writers. Um, if we once we experience uh, our own pain because you know we tend to be quite articulate we understand the human anatomy and nobody understands human suffering and the human condition like we do and we can put that to paper quite quite easily yeah yeah um 
no you're right uh, what 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 got you interested in, in coaching why why coaching um i think my own my own problems really so i, I went through a phase where a couple of years ago i was really low in mood and i kind of then read a, 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 a lot around philosophy and um you know kind of uh orientalism and kind of the samurai way and stoicism amongst the greeks and the romans and i just wanted to apply that and make them more accessible when i read i read very heavily and i just kind of deep dived into a lot of old books and i thought i could distill that for the busy professional so that's what kind of led me into coaching i thought you know i've read a lot of books i i i, I did my diploma in coaching and life coaching and um i i could use some of my techniques to use in medicine which is you know advanced communication breaking bad news and all that kind of thing and empathy building and rapport and you know keeping the patient comfortable i mean why These coaching kind of, why not you know why not counseling or, or sort of therapy yeah i think counseling requires a bit more kind of ratification and a bit more you know a certification and you know uh, this more regulated and i didn't want to do you know i know people do counseling but um I think uh, counselling for me would have been a lot of, you know, because with counselling, there's a lot of, obviously, there's people out there who need marital counselling, they need all sorts of psychological counselling. I just didn't feel myself ready at the time. And I think coaching's, so to speak, a bit of a softer version of counselling, um, as in, you know, you want, you, you're there to listen and offer solutions somewhat, whereas counselling is very much solution driven. And I just didn't have the mental fortitude to give solutions. I just wanted to listen and impart some knowledge uh, impartially rather than counselling, which is quite heavy involvement and lots of sessions. Yeah, I mean, co coaching is a lot more about facilitation and, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, facilitate the uh, uh, the client to, to actually come up with the answers themselves, yeah. uh, which exactly. is quite an interesting dynamic. Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, when I went through my, existential crisis and i saw a friend they suggested seeing a life coach that's what mm -hmm. happened at the time mm -hmm. and i was like fuck this i'm not seeing a life <laughs> coach you know because because there is a kind of like a fluffy yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. uh connection to sort of life coaching it's like you know that's for you know people that live in california and and yeah and, hippies and, and yeah. drinking drinking matcha matcha green tea and all these things <laughs> You know, not for physicians. So I mean, I was like totally dismissive about it. And then they suggested seeing a um, a Canadian life coach, and um, and I did. I saw him, um, and yeah, it was really good. It was literally changed my perspective. You know, as 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 you said, I sort of uh, used different glasses to look at the world, and it was really, you know, it didn't take long. And I was quite surprised how you know how much of a positive effect that it had in my life and I mean you know I didn't solve my existential crisis but but then I realized that there are other um, yeah. alternative realities so to speak out there <laughs> um, but then I had more questions rather than answers which was an interesting <laughs> dynamic as well and, and, and you think to yourself right yeah things are going to get even more interesting um, <laughs> But that's the journey, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, course, being yeah. comfortable with this with this uncertainty and where we like certainty in in, in medicine, don't we? Medicine, yeah, yeah, yeah. We like certainty. We, we don't like risk. We don't like grey areas. And I think w once you come up against your very own existential crisis, we as doctors kind of flap. We don't know what to do because we spend all our lives giving solutions, but internally when we come up come up against our own problems and personal and, and, and professional problems we kind of don't know how to deal with it because all our, our joy is empty our cup is empty because it's been poured out for the people so i think having a life coach is, is is a great call but we as doctors are quite reluctant to seek help because we are the caregivers and it's a really good question who cares for the carers and it, often they're the ones that are neglected so i think seeking a line you know, i've had coaching myself i've had counseling actually last year and it's helped me massively. And um, I think uh, it's something which I encourage doctors to do. Have, you know, career coaching, life, uh, life coaching, counselling if needed. And then a lot of doctors and nurses did have counselling because of COVID, PTSD and all that kind of thing. Um, so it, it was available on the NHS.
and there was an increased uptake of counselling amongst physicians and nurses uh, post COVID, which I think is a great thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's a whole industry now of um, you know physician coaches and yeah, uh, yeah. you know physician counsellors and yeah, um, you know people who are there to sort of uh, help physicians and uh, healthcare providers and you know healthcare mm-hmm. professionals get back on their feet again uh you know the yeah. good news is is that we're good patients doctors tend to be <laughs> doctors and nurses tend to be good patients um because we know what makes a good patient and you know most of us want to get better you know there are a few yeah, people you know who don't want to get better and uh, but most of us are, are reasonably sensible yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and and um you've recently kind of jumped ship and and changed career what what was the uh what was the catalyst for that and um, what happened? The catalyst for, for that was I can wear jumpers every day, <laughs> Monday to Friday, and I can wake up at 8.50 and just log into my laptop instead of commuting one hour in the snow. Uh, so that's a big bonus. But the catalyst for that really, like I mentioned earlier, I was, I've always flirted with the idea of consulting. Uh, my public health master's kind of led me down strategy and healthcare management and and regulation and particularly healthcare systems. So in the UK, we used to have SHAs, which are strategic health authorities and primary care trusts. So my master's looked at how that's relevant and then things change with CCGs. So I've always had a a kind of a, 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 you know, a long, a a long-term kind of upstream view of health systems. Although I worked on the very much on the front line, I still had a, a bird's eye view of it. And when the opportunity came, uh, when certain firms were looking for doctors to join their growing teams looking at COVID recovery, particularly in the public sector, I jumped on board. Um, I thought the time was right for me. I had done my my part in the NHS, 10 years of service. I had done two years working in COVID and I joined in November last year. So all, Nothing you know, pushed I, you in that direction. Did anything push you in that direction? I think a few things would have pushed me, yeah. So I've, uh, like, I'm quite outspoken. I'm, I'm uh, well, I, I'm very outspoken at times. And uh, I think putting your head above the parapet. So what happened with me, I got, um, um, I got to refer to the GMC in the very first wave. And that was in April, 2020. And that was a very long 18 months, which just grinded me down, grinded me down. And then I was exonerated, thankfully in October, And I thought being a young doctor, BAME persuasion, um, you know, someone who's quite outspoken, there was always this dagger hanging over my head. All it takes is one referral. Was it a patient uh, or was it a colleague? No, it wasn't a colleague or patient. It was a medical director who got things wrong. Absolutely misread the situation. I was speaking about PPE and misread it and actually now what i said was completely correct because I, I talked about ppe shortages bame deaths and that was in april 2020 uh, and that was you know because i was there on the front line i was seeing patterns emerge and they they referred me for not speaking me uh, for for going on an unauthorized interview and i think that was you know my naivety at the time because it was the first time i'd been, been interviewed by by the media I used Skype interview similar similar to this, but I hadn't sought the necessary permissions from the legal uh, from the communications and media department within wow. the hospital. Wow! So that was a long process, and they, you know when it came and I got the email saying, you know what, the all the claims were completely uh, miscommunication between GMC and the trust, and I was exonerated. I thought, gosh, what happens to the mental impact that's put upon me? I went through hell. Uh, during that time did you get any support I work for a few months. yeah i got support yeah i got some like i said counseling bma doctors um doctor support service um this very good program run, run by claire Gir- um claire gerada called the PHP practitioner health program that was very good I, I recommend that for any doctor who's going through any kind of dis- uh, investigative procedures or disciplinary actions or you know just burnout or any kind of career um crisis so i recommend that and they were immensely helpful and um and then i thought you know what i, I still got my, my registration so i might even work next weekend you know like i'm still available to work and and i occasionally do work the, the weekend 
as a medical reg um, at the local hospital. But sub substantively, I've left medicine. So I'm working now you know, primarily in consulting and I'm, I'm happy that way. I can work ad hoc as a doctor. It's not my only salary uh, and, and I'm enjoying consulting. I, I get to make decisions. I get to lead a team. I'm, I'm the clinical lead for uh, within my department for track and trace. And, um, and yeah, you know, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying working with different people, you know, graduates and senior colleagues and partners, etc. I'm enjoying that aspect of it. And like I say, I'm enjoying working from home and having endless coffee. And endless ice creams as well, by, by the looks of it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Quite a weird combination. You know, um, it's called an affogato. When you, when you put ice cream in a coffee, you can, you can buy it from the shops. You can actually get ice, ice cream coffee. So instead of milk, they put ice cream in there. Lovely. But then the coffee becomes lukewarm because of the ice cream. Yeah. Oh, that's doable for me. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. What's that called? Is, is it it's called affogato. Affogato, I believe. Okay. And it's a, it's a creamy ice cream coffee. But I've never tried it. Well, you know, that's that's definitely worth doing. And and I mean, how, how, how is it different, uh, the work that you're doing? I mean, what what's what I mean, up, up, obviously, apart from, you know, the things that you mentioned, you know, what, 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 what what's the biggest difference that you've noticed? I think the biggest difference is um, constant meetings. So we have like five meetings a day and, uh, you know, within our teams and externally. So if I'm working with the hospital, I'll be having meetings with their chief nurse, their deputy medical director, their director of strategy, et cetera, about our recommendations and our inputs. And then, you know, I'm, I'm quite heavily involved in recruitment as well. So if, if the team needs to grow, we get some uh, senior consultants on board because I work at the manager level. So we get people, senior consultants and a consultant. So quite heavily involved in recruitment because this space is growing, healthcare consulting is growing over the next couple of years. So even within, uh, within our departments, we are recruiting quite heavily, especially graduate, uh, graduate entry roles. So I'm heavily involved in recruitment, heavily involved in um, kind of budgeting, uh, pricing models for, for our team. Luckily, because of COVID, we, we don't actually have to go to client sites, but consulting beforehand was heavily based at client sites. So if you work for a hospital in Scotland, you'll be there for three months. And you come back to the office on Fridays, but now it's all, you know, exclusively work from home. Yeah, benefits of COVID. Um, yes. And like looking forward, say in sort of five years' time, what 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 kind of landscape do you do you see being involved in? Yeah, so similar landscape, healthcare. But I, I would love to do more international healthcare, so global health uh, in the developing world, looking at sanitation, water projects, uh, you know, vaccination uptakes. Um, because that again is, is one of my interests, you know, global uh, gl global burden of disease, poverty poverty alleviation. So at the moment, I'm working very much in the UK, and COVID has dominated everything. But I think within healthcare consulting, once COVID kind of settles in the next one or two years, I think healthcare consulting will be more global, and you will, you know, a lot of consulting firms like the one I work for, and you know, the the the, the bigger ones, they will certainly be working alongside the UN, UNICEF, WHO. IMF looking at financing schemes and yeah, you know various uh, healthcare projects in the developing world because I think the biggest indicator of, of a country's prosperity is, is is health, isn't it? If you look at Norway and Japan, they've got the longest life expectancies, and that's usually concordant with prosperity as a country, economic prosperity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 do you, do you think they're sort of uh, is is prosperity more sort of physical or metaphysical, or is it sort of a combination of both? Great question, Heather. I think that's 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 that, that stems from your existential crisis. It's a very <laughs> brutal question. That <laughs> uh, I think prosperity um, on you can you can look at you can look at it from an individual level. I think prosperity from an individual level is um, you know happiness, fulfillment. I always always um, I, I always say health is wealth but what is health health is many many things health is physical health mental health emotional health financial health you know let's not forget you know financial health uh, if you're financially poor and in bad health it can affect your mental health your spiritual health and your physical health 
So th they're the aspects of health. And I think health equals wealth. But health is not just physical health, but it's many facets. So I think for me, that's prosperity. Um, you know, the, the many on an individual level, but on a on a kind of macro level, looking at the country as a whole, prosperity means you know, gender equality. It means educational attainment. It means low maternal deaths. It means access to healthcare. It means you know you know uh, literacy. All these parameters. So I think that's prosperity. Uh, prosperity on a on a national level, and I think we need to translate that to a global level as well, because there's massive north-south divide. As in, sort of UK north north-south divide. No, or... no, no. I mean, I mean globally. So look, look at north, you know, Europe, and then the south. Yeah, yes. but in the UK as well, of course. Yes, there's yeah. there's a north-south divide. You know, life expectancy does decrease the further up north you go. So you know, Sunderland and Newcastle is like almost like eight years difference compared to London. Like you know, certain parts of London, like Kensington, and it's even further down south. So you go to Maidstone and uh, Tunbridge Wells, and it's, it's even you know, life expectancy is even greater. So there's a north-south divide in most countries. You know, uh, you know, in, in Iraq, in Pakistan, there's a huge north-south divide, <laughs> and um, you know, most countries. But across the world, there's a north-south divide. You know, in terms of healthcare outcomes, literacy, uh, you know, amount of people that are being moved out of poverty as well. So. A good marker of that is how many people are in secure employment, and uh, you know it's a huge uh, disparity between the south and the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think you know, generally speaking, absolute poverty has decreased, which has been uh, yes, absolutely exactly, wonderful. Yeah. And um, if you look at China, great example. China saw so a lot of people have been moved out of poverty um, in the last ten years, really. So uh, I think a good indicator of that is how many more middle class you know jobs and households have been created and that's a great marker of people from working class or the underclass being moved into middle class and you know i think I mean, xi jinping's done quite a good job in, in that sense well you know i mean they've done well to sort of actually uh, amalgamated the authoritarian way of uh, you know delivering um politics um with the capitalization of of, of the market and it's it's um mm. Seem to have done wonders. Obviously, the US are not happy about that because, you know, they've got a big superpower that that, that they have to contend with mm. on a yeah, yeah. capitalistic, uh, yeah, yeah, um, sphere. But um, yeah, you know, things are moving forward. Uh, but certainly, there's a lot of challenges there, and it's complicated. You know, there's, it is, there's, yeah. there, there, there's so many facets there. But um, but it's good to see that you're you're kind of you know, found your niche, so to speak, and, you know, it's sort of working for you. And I think we've caught you at a good time coming back from, you know, the spiritual center um, uh, of, of yourself. So, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, the spirit is a recharge, so to speak, and I'm sure there's yeah. lots of challenges uh, ahead of you, which you'll use your stoic abilities to, to <laughs> overcome. Yes, yes. I think uh, spiritually recharge for the Surgical Spirit podcast. Look at that. It's a mouthful, <laughs> but yeah, it works. <laughs> well, I mean, you've just had a mouthful of uh, ice cream. So, uh, so, you know, that, so that's okay. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I like to end with this, uh, you know, on our podcast and, you know, uh, with this question, which is uh, given that you've sort of experienced what you've experienced over the last 10 years as a, as a medical doctor, um, and, you know, if we look at Asif as he's about to start medical school, um, what would your sort of three top tips be to him, having experienced what you've experienced over the last uh, decade? Mine would be work on your weak points. So, you know, don't just double down on your strength. So when I was selecting my uh, what we called SSC, so self-selected components, I just tend, tended to do things I liked, like global uh, health and international healthcare, etc. I should have done something like Spanish or something, you know, something completely out of my comfort zone. And I would have actually, you know, um, it's good to double down on your strengths, but I think it's more important to work on your weaknesses. So, you know, things which I was quite weak at, like anthropology, anatomy, and pharmacology, I should have done them in my optional modules. Uh, I think the second one is um, when opportunity comes, say yes and learn on the job. I think a lot of people have imposter syndrome. 
and uh, you know, they say I'm not ready. If you if you if you're not ready, and you know, if you're waiting until you are ready to say yes, you'll be waiting all your life. So I think it's better to say yes. So when they asked me if I wanted to step up as a consultant, I said yes, and I literally you know stepped up and. You know, it, it, you know, it went much better than I thought. And I think the old ASIF at med school would have said no. And I think um, a third one is, you know, have a wide network, you know, have, have friends who are non-medics and have, you know, uh, I think medics tend to, most of our friends tend to be medics, we marry medics, we live with medics. So, um, you know, I've got a couple of friends from university who are non-medics, but I wish I had more, you know, it's great to network. And now I'm in consulting, pretty much everyone is a non-medic and uh you know a lot of people went to my actually they went to my university but i didn't even know them because i didn't interact with them and they actually went to the university at the same time as me and i'm like gosh if only if i interacted with these people and uh, you know made friends in outside of medicine you know in computer science and these kind of things because it only broadens your mind you know we, we get to uh, in medicine we, we we become in echo chambers you know we, we like you know got med twitter and linkedin and, and all these platforms we just regurgitate a lot of the same information Ah, I think we've lost you. Well, Asif, I think the uh, the ice cream has won. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure li listening to you today and uh, speaking with you today. And um, we'll say goodbye. <laughs>